Welcome back, my friends, to the Ironclad Lion channel. You have made your way to the fourth and final episode of the Star Sector campaign walkthrough series. This episode will be moving much quicker than the first three episodes and will be getting us just past the early game and into a comfortable place in the sector. If you are brand new and want to see the earliest stages of the game, I suggest watching the previous three episodes first. If you want to see how to start in the sector after finishing the main tutorial, this episode is perfect for you. Let's jump into chapter Chapter 17, Our First Bounty. Our bounty for Bolg is located near a rocky ice world in a system with a brown primary star, in the Alexiar Nebula. Since we're currently near the nebula in question, now we need to find the brown star. There's two brown stars, so we'll start with Epsilon. By default, would usually jump through the inner system jump point, but since we've been given a warning that there are hostiles near that jump point, we'll opt for the fringe jump point instead. Unless you are very confident in your fleet, it's almost always better to jump into a system safely than gamble on a dangerous jump. Once we're in the system, we'll need to locate the Bounty Fleet, which was reported to be hiding near a rocky ice world. The planets in this system were mostly clustered around the star, so we'll need to burn in that direction. As the rocky ice world comes into visual range, we'll perform a long-range scan to make sure we don't get surprised by anything. We've got an unidentified fleet that seems to match the composition of our bounty, but we'll need to get closer to confirm its identity. Once we have our ID, we can pursue. Our fleet is significantly bigger than theirs, so the bounty fleet will attempt to flee from combat. To stop them from doing so, we can use the interdiction pulse. We successfully hit the pirate fleet with the interdiction pulse, but another variable has entered the fray. A small remnant fleet in the system wants to understand our intentions. While it might seem they wish to engage in combat, make sure you read the encounter message and go through your options. This small drone fleet is ready to fight, but it isn't assuming an aggressive posture. We can safely disengage without a fight. Now here's where things get a little complicated, but it'll work well for demonstration purposes. The remnant fleet was able to catch the pirate fleet before we were, and initiated combat. Because we are not friendly with either the pirates or the remnant, we are unable to join either side in combat, and must wait until their combat has finished. Painfully wait. There are good things and bad things that can happen here. The biggest bad thing that can happen is if the remnants were able to take out Bolg's ship, which is our bounty target. That means we don't get paid very bad. The good news is, whichever fleet comes out of this combat alive will be significantly weaker due to having recently been deployed in combat. In this scenario, the pirate fleet was able to dispose of the two remnant ships, so our bounty remains intact, and will quickly intercept the pirate fleet. Fortune favors the bold, and the pirate fleet has their combat readiness reduced significantly, which will make this combat even easier for us. Since we're getting paid for this, we're going to make sure we do a good job, and we'll be deploying seven ships in total. All combat ships, except the hounds. This is more than enough as the enemy fleet is only composed of frigates. Methodically, we'll butcher each buccaneer and poach the privateer's property, and get paid handsomely for it. With the carnivorous combat concluded, we've acquired a succulent skill point. But before we distribute our debauchery, we'll have burgeoning business to attend to. With the bounty blasted, the copious credits have been deposited into our booming bank account. Exquisite. With a fistful of dollars, it's time to better ourselves for the future challenges we may face. We have helmsmanship and salvaging, both solid skills. We could go a number of ways with our skill points. Star Sector allows for a lot of freedom in that regard. One skill I recommend when you are learning the game is bulk transport. It'll massively boost your cargo, crew, and and fuel reserves in your fleet, and is most effective in a small fleet such as the one we have currently. This skill can help in almost any profession you go into. Greater cargo capacity will help with salvaging and looting as well as general hauling. Greater crew capacity is great for raiding as well as colonization efforts. And additional fuel is pretty great no matter what kind of fleet you are flying, it's an all around useful skill. Now that we've completed our bounty, we'll need to head back to the core worlds where we can refit and refuel our fleet. We'll plot a course for Yama and get moving. In hyperspace, do your best to avoid the hyperspace storms, as running through them will damage your ships, costing valuable supplies to recover, as well as potentially sending your fleet off course. We'll also want to keep an eye out for scurvy scavengers such as this fleet, as they can turn hostile if they think your fleet looks tasty enough. Best to keep your distance from any fleet that is larger than your own until you can properly identify them. While at Nachiketa, we may have partaken in some dubious bartering to avoid local tariffs. While we tried to trade some legal goods to cover our suspicion, it was still enough to attract attention from the local authorities. We could wave our hand and tell them these aren't the ships you're looking for, but we're confident 
confident they won't find anything. We don't have any drugs or AI cores on board, so we'll allow the scan. This is a good reason why you should have hounds or Cerberus frigates in your fleet in the early game, as their shielded cargo holds can protect your valuable loot from the prying eyes of the space police. Our next mission will have us surveying a jungle planet to the relative south of us on the galactic map. We'll need enough crew, supplies, and heavy machinery to complete this mission. It'll pay a nice 40,000 credits and is within a reasonable distance. Our other marked missions are a little farther away, so we'll complete this mission first. You may also notice that this mission is actually provided by the pirates. While we aren't exactly friendly with the pirates, these missions don't require any standing with the faction providing them. As long as they get done, you'll get paid, and even a small reputation boost with said faction, if such things matter to you. We're all stocked up on fuel and supplies, so we're ready for adventure. We've gone over nebula and hyperspace storms we can run into, but what about slipstreams? Slipstreams in hyperspace will push any fleet along its path. These can be both a blessing and a curse, depending on where they end up taking you. We got caught in the tail end of a slipstream, which usually wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't for the pirate fleet waiting at the end of it. The pirate fleet caught us in a perfect interdiction pulse, preventing an easy escape. There isn't much we can do, and the pirate corsair fleet is able to catch us. We could try to flee, but we also might be able to take this fight. The pirate ships are rust buckets, but they have a destroyer and a cruiser. The only way we'll be able to win is with clever tactics, since we're attacked genius, we're going to take this fleet head on. We'll deploy every combat capable vessel, as this will be an all hands on deck battle. Kites make excellent escort ships, so we'll make sure they are escorting our destroyers. Our Cerberus is also quite slow and vulnerable, so we'll give him a hand to hold. When in doubt, use the buddy system, as lone ships will easily get picked off unless they are fast enough to get out of bad situations. This fight is going to be focused around the enemy pirate cruiser, as it is the biggest threat that none of our ships can take in a 1v1 scenario. Scenario. So as soon as we get visual, we're going to assign our fleet a very special and very important order. Avoid that cruiser at all costs. The avoid order will make sure our fleet stays out of the cruiser's range, letting us focus on the rest of the fleet. The rest of the pirate ships are easy targets, so it's just a matter of picking them off one by one. We'll need to be patient and only target the ships that stray away from the cruiser. While you may consider yourself an ace pilot, always be aware of the limits of your ship, and back away from combat if you are taking too much pressure. Now, many of you probably consider yourselves hardcore gamers, and something you may have learned over the years was use the environment to your advantage. Positioning is key, and other clever things Sun Tzu probably said. Now, in space, there isn't a whole lot of terrain to use to your advantage, but what we do have is spaceships. So by circling the enemy Cerberus, which we've disabled, we can vent our flux while preventing the enemy wolf from getting a clean shot at us. Pretty cheeky, right? Once our flux is vented, we're going to hug the enemy wolf so it'll have to think twice about using that reaper torpedo on us. By staying in knife fight range, we'll get our point defense lasers to fire on the enemy wolf, easily overpowering it. Bada bing, bada boom! With all the smaller pirate ships disabled, we can finally focus the enemy cruiser. Not everyone in our fleet got the memo about staying away from the front of the enemy flagship, but being the resourceful captain that we are, every ship in our fleet serves a purpose. Some more dignifying than others, but a purpose nonetheless. After several minutes of bombardment, the pirate cruiser is but a heap of molten slag. This was our toughest fight yet, and wasn't a clean victory, but these pirates won't be bothering us anymore. We're able to recover several of our disabled ships and collect a respectable amount of loot. If that were the only thing we received, would pretty much break even. But what makes that combat worthwhile is getting paid for taking out enemies of the hegemony as well as receiving a lot of combat experience. The additional experience will not only make us stronger, but will increase the amount of credits we gain from our our commission. It's also worth noting that we're gathering experience for our officers in each deployed combat as well. Now that we're done dealing with pirates, we can focus on what we actually came here for, surveying a jungle planet. Jungle planets are one of the naturally habitable planet types in the sector, and any habitable planet is worth checking out, whether you are getting paid for it or not. This happened to be an extra juicy mission that was too good to pass up, so we're accomplishing multiple things while we do this mission. As we approach the planet, it looks like we've got some stellar shape 
shades around the planet. These are effectively massive mirrors in orbit around the planet, which is great for colonization. We won't know for sure if we have a winning planet until we survey it though. From orbit, we can easily see the intrinsic traits of the planet and get a sense of its weather patterns and habitability. A closer survey will allow us to see what natural resources are on the planet and then allow us to colonize if the planet is worthy. What we've found is a class 5 planet. Class 5 planets are the rarest planets in the sector and have the most potential for colonization. At least, someone thinks so. We had high hopes for this planet when we spotted the orbital shades, but upon closer inspection, this planet would be a pain to colonize. It lacks significant natural resources, and while the stellar shades boost farming production, this planet only possesses poor farmland. It seems like this planet was an early, desperate attempt for colonization in the sector, as there remains a decivilized subpopulation. As we look through each trait in detail, it appears that this planet is a trap for an uneducated fleet captain. With a hazard rating of 175% and mediocre industry potential, this planet should be avoided. What not to avoid? Exploring those ruins. Planets with ruins on them should always be explored. There can be rare ships, technology, as well as just a pile of loot. You really never know. The ruins on this jungle planet aren't noteworthy, but we can always take additional supplies. Out in fringe territory, you can also find derelict stations such as old orbital habitats as well as mining stations. These large orbital structures can often contain rare technology and plentiful materials. And when I say plentiful, I mean stuff your cargo holds. When salvaging these structures, bring your haulers and be prepared to dump low-value equipment. Ore, scrap metals, and food are usually the first bulk goods you can discard, as those are not worth many credits and can pile up quickly. If you are unsure about which cargo to grab, scroll over the material to see its base value. So we have our first 100,000 credits, and we have a decent idea of how to make money in Star Sector. But how do we make mo money mo quickly? Let me tell you about advanced navigation. While much of Star Sector involves combat of some sort, it's just as important to understand how to get from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. We're looking for a modest 41,000 credit bounty, and this bounty is rather far away. The trick is, the mission states that the bounty is located in a giant primary star system, which in this particular nebula, there happens to be three of. So for now, we'll navigate towards the closest primary star and go from there. Remember our old friend, the hyperspace storm? We're going to go through some of them, on purpose. Now the game recommends using the emergency burn ability to easily punch through these storms, but that burns unnecessary supplies in the process. What we're going to do instead is fly through the storms, but at just enough of an angle so we'll be thrown in the direction we want. Pay attention to my mouse cursor while I'm doing this to get an idea of the angle you need. By hitting hyperspace storms like this, some of your ships will be damaged, but the storms can actually boost your fleet much faster to your destination. So if you are in a hurry, you can use this method to efficiently navigate through storms. While we have been avoiding the slipstream so we won't get pushed in the opposite direction, it begins to fade as we get closer to our destination. If you do, however, ever get caught in a bad slipstream or storm, that's when you can use emergency burn to get yourself back on course. As we get towards the first primary star, we'll double check the mission briefing. Our bounty will be located by a volcanic planet, so we can quickly see once we are in system if there are any volcanic planets. Since there is one, there's a possibility the bounty could be within this system as it meets all the criteria of the bounty mission. Turns out this isn't the volcanic planet we're looking for, so we're out of luck. This also happens to be a relatively large system, so we've also burned precious time in the process. Let's get back to the jump point as quickly as possible. What's this? A remnant fleet on a direct intercept course with us? And good lord, they have already begun an interdiction pulse. This, my friend, is what the emergency burn was built for. We're going to burn in the opposite direction and with quick reaction time, we've barely managed to avoid interdiction. We'll boost into the nearby nebula to escape the enemy fleet. Our sensor profile is halved inside the nebula, so we'll also use this opportunity to take a hard turn with sustained burn. We don't need to completely lose the remnant fleet, just get around it. And to the jump point. With some clever navigation, we've dodged the remnants and can escape safely. The Nexar also happened to be a rather large system, with no less than four volcanic planets, meaning we had to fly all over the place, and still, no bounty to be found. It's time for hard decisions. We could search the last of the primary stars for the bounty, but we're running out of time on both our missions. So instead, 
said, we'll leave the bounty and go for the derelict ship mission, which is worth more credits at 60,000. Our clue is that the derelict is located at the heart of the system, or in other words, very close to the star, making it an easy find. If we don't have time to go for the bounty, we'll take the better of the two missions to complete. While traveling to the Analyze mission, we'll make sure to use the hyperspace boosting technique we discussed earlier. Since we are very tight on time, we'll take the most direct path we can. There is, of course, a good deal of risk in navigating in such a manner. If we get thrown off course, it could cost us a lot of supplies, as well as time to get back. So we'll need to be wise about which storms we go through and which ones we avoid. Once we get into the system, it doesn't take us long to find the derelict we are looking for. This one happens to be an Atlas-class super freighter, the biggest dedicated hauling ship in the game. Being in the heart of the system makes the target quite easy to find, but fighting against a star's corona can be very costly to your fleet. If it is very deep inside the corona, use emergency burn. Now we have the choice of recovering the atlas or salvaging it. We could do either, but we're going to grab it so we can haul whatever loot we find back to a planet to sell. Usually the best option is to mothball any ship you find in deep space, and then restore it once you return to a station. But in this case, we can immediately use the atlas for loot hauling, even in its decrepit state. With 60,000 credits in our pocket and an atlas in tow, we might just have enough time to get back and secure that bounty, so we'll get moving. Without mothballing the Atlas Super Freighter, we're paying for its full maintenance cost. This includes both supplies and fuel, so we'll need to make a trip to the Core World soon. While traveling through hyperspace, you may encounter sensor ghosts. These may spook you from time to time, but don't worry, they are perfectly harmless. Except when they're not. The Atlas is making our fleet significantly slower, so we'll have to use the hyperspace storms if we have any hope of securing that bounty bounty. Even with a sluggish fleet like ours, the storms can quickly push us where we need to go. This primary star looks promising, as it has many planetary jump points available. There's a very good chance our man is in this system. As soon as we're in system, we can quickly check our mission briefing. Forget searching around aimlessly. We'll get a confirmation the bounty is in the Namer system. There's still a lot of volcanic plants to search though, so we need to move quickly. The best thing we can do is perform a quick scan and look for sensor blips. This time though, we got lucky. We have confirmation on our bounty, but we need to take him out before the bounty expires. Even though we can't confirm the interdiction pulse, we're pretty sure we got him, but the magnetic field of this gas giant is blocking our sensors. We'll use emergency burn and close in for the kill. At this point in our campaign, an enemy pirate fleet consisting of only four ships is rather trivial, but no matter how small the mission, chaining missions together with proper navigation can net you pretty significant amount of credits. Not to mention that any combat we take part in is additional experience for our character and officers. With this small bounty in our bank, we've gathered up an impressive amount of credits in a short amount of time. At the end of every good mission chain, we'll need to head back to a core world to refit and refuel. Our fuel gauge is close to empty, so we don't exactly have a lot of choice in which systems to refuel in. Before we plot a course to any specific system, it's always a good idea to check the faction directory to see which factions you are hostile with. Since we're commissioned with the Hegemony, we'll need to avoid Persian League and try Tachyon Space, as we won't be allowed to dock at a hostile faction's planet or station. The Ludic Church, however, is not hostile with us, allowing us to land and refuel in church territory. Since we're in the southwestern territory, territory of the sector, that's going to be our best option. But if I see two ships with white shirts and ties, I'm leaving. Our main stop will be Tartessus, a Stability 10 arid world. Stability 10 worlds are well established and have plentiful commodities available to purchase. This is going to be a big stop and we plan on spending around 100,000 credits. What you'll notice is I'm trying to balance my black market transactions with my legal transactions, in an attempt to mitigate our suspicion. Our fleet isn't as small as it used to be so we have to be careful about purchasing large amounts of goods from the black market. Let's talk about the Atlas Super Freighter we picked up on one of our last missions. This thing is big, can hold a lot, but is it a good freighter for our fleet at this time? This Atlas has two D-mods, compromised storage, and degraded drive field. Compromised storage means this Atlas can only hold 75% of its usual cargo and fuel, while degraded drive field means that its maximum burn is only 5. A maximum burn of 5 is painfully slow, so not only is this thing not hauling like it should, 
good, it's dragging our fleet down, which could be very dangerous if we needed to avoid an enemy fleet. It was temporarily useful for dragging back all our loot to sell, but we need to cut this thing loose and acquire ourselves a freighter that fits our fleet. So on that note, we'll be replacing our Atlas with a Mule, a destroyer class combat freighter. The Mule is a well-rounded ship able to haul a hefty amount of cargo and still provide good support in combat. It has a much lower fuel and supply maintenance cost compared to the Atlas, as well as a maximum burn of 9. So while we are sacrificing some cargo hauling capability, this mule is a much better fit and has no demods to speak of. We'll spend a bit of time hopping from planet to planet in the system, buying a few weapons, refitting our ships, updating old loadouts, even buying another wolf frigate because why not? These things are great. We've also spotted a reasonable bounty next to a survey mission, so it looks like we've got our next excursion plan for us. There are many ways to earn money in Star Sector. You can smuggle legal goods, sell arms to the Lodic Path, go to war with another faction, raid planets and stations, the list goes on. But what I'm showing you now and focusing on in this series is what I think is the most approachable, reliable, and balanced way to make money. You can easily go on a mix of bounty hunting, survey, and exploration missions. You'll be getting paid, leveling up quickly, and also collecting rare technology from old domain derelicts. It's also worth mentioning that doing these missions will boost your reputation with various factions, while other activities like smuggling have a greater risk of reducing your relations. The main risk of this style of gameplay is, you are operating outside of legal, colonized space. You don't have to worry about the authorities out here, but pirates and remnant are always a danger, and a smart fleet captain must stay vigilant if they wish to survive. And when it comes to survival, a huge part of being a good fleet captain is understanding your limits. This bounty mission I've accepted is right on the edge of what I think our fleet can handle. Handle. I spent the first couple of minutes taking out smaller targets and ordering my fleet to avoid the cruiser as usual, but in this battle our hammerhead actually got caught by the cruiser and was unable to disengage. With the hammerhead down, I knew I had to move quickly. I flamed out the enemy flagship cruiser and got to work on the rest of the fleet. The only way we'd be able to win is if we could surround the flagship, and to do that we'd need to finish off the other ships promptly before the flagship could regroup. With our single strongest ship taken out of the battle, it took every one of our ships hitting the cruiser to bring it down. And even then, it took a long time and we lost several ships in the process. Worth it, but if the bounty fleet had been any bigger, we might have been in real trouble. The winner gets to pick up the pieces after the battle, but having to recover multiple ships every combat is a good sign you are flirting with death. I happen to like the way death whispers sweet nothings into my ear, and those whispers happen to contain a skill point, which we'll be putting into tactical drills, a great skill for both fleet-wide damage boost and enhanced ground operations. And speaking of ground operations, we've got a survey mission to take care of that's nearby. A nice 50,000 credits for surveying a barren world. Now as we get closer, we spot what looks like a friendly exploration fleet. But beware of such fleets, this happens to be the thirsty salvage type. So instead of trying to run away, we're going to slip right past this fleet and into the jump point. Now we have about a single second of lead time on this fleet, which we'll need every second of. We will maintain sustain burn, and because their fleet is rather large, they simply can't keep up with us, even when using emergency burn. Remember the Atlas? This is exactly why we sold that coffin. If our maximum burn was 5 instead of 9 like it is currently, we absolutely would have been caught by that fleet. Looks like they've given up, and we can continue our survey mission. In addition to the survey we must perform, there seems to be a data core sitting on this planet. It seems to belong to the Galati Academy. Let's scoop it up. In addition, we found vast ruins in our survey. Vast ruins can contain all kinds of lost technology, so let's loot. Tech and blueprints can be learned by right-clicking on them in the inventory. I won't go over each one of these in detail as you never know what you'll find. I'll let you do the exploring. And since we're in the mood for exploring, let's take a look around the system. I noticed there was a blue planet signifying a water world. Much like the jungle world we surveyed earlier, water worlds are one of the naturally habitable planet types and are always worth checking out. It's at this point in the game that colonization should be on your mind. Even though we are not equipped to properly colonize a world, we should be on the lookout for good systems. I mentioned before 
before that a hazard rating of 175 is on the high end and should generally be avoided unless there's significant resources. This water planet, on the other hand, does not have a ton of resources, but also is sitting at a comfortable 125 hazard rating, which I think is a nice sweet spot. It's possible to get 100 or 75% has rating planets, but there are usually only two or three of those generated in the entire sector. So as we survey this water planet, we'll get a class 4 survey rating. Under normal circumstances, we'd happily colonize this planet, as the low hazard rating and plentiful organics would sustain the planet nicely. The scattered ruins were actually more abundant with materials than we initially thought, so we'll have to do some sorting for what we want to take home. With our cargo holds full and missions completed, it's time we once again head back to the Core Worlds to sell our loot and resupply. Wouldn't that be nice? I would have gotten away with it too, if it weren't for those meddling remnants! A rather large remnant Ordo fleet is between us and freedom, so we'll need to find another way around. You see that explosion in the distance there? That was the big and thirsty salvage fleet we saw earlier, just floating space junk now. That will be us if we get caught by one of these fleets. We'll have to keep a low profile and go dark here. <laughs> We may have avoided one fleet, but now there's two guarding the jump point. We'll have to take a different one out of this system. Oh no, 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 not the interdiction boss. No! Emergency burn! Well, we have one last jump point to try. Ah, oh, nuts. Ah, nuts! We'll just need to do the old sector swoop on them. Bring them out into the asteroid belt, and while they're in the belt, we swoop! That's how it's done right there, ladies! Maintaining complete composure and not at all afraid of losing our fleet, we've made it out of that godforsaken system. A keen captain would have spotted this warning beacon. A red warning beacon like this one means, don't go in there. Many have entered, few return. If you are just beginning your journey in Star Sector, it's best you avoid such systems altogether. If you have a survey mission or bounty, just don't. If you are thinking about taking the remnant head on, you'll need a very sizable fleet and, well, you'll need to know what you are doing. Heed the warning beacons, they are there for a reason. We don't have anything else to do now, so we're going to head back to the Core Worlds and visit the Galadia Academy by Pontus. We've got a data core that seems to belong to them, but we're not going to hand that over just yet. That data core is tied to the main Galadia Academy storyline, and we're not going to dive into that in this video, but let's take a look at where we are and how far we've come. We started with two little ships in episode one and have built a respectable fleet with several capable officers at our command. And through our hard work, now we have an awesome 350,000 credits to our name. What do we do from here? Well, whatever we feel like, really. We could try to find a nice planet to colonize, take on more bounties, pursue the storyline quests, whatever we want. And this whole journey really didn't take us long at all. Between an hour to two hours of gameplay, and we're in a very comfortable spot. So, my friends, thank you for joining me on this journey, and I hope you learned a lot about becoming a fleet captain in Star Sector. There's much more to learn, this is just the beginning. So get out there, explore, and have some fun. This walkthrough series has taken just over two Two months to put together, so I'd appreciate a like on the videos if you enjoyed them. It really helps me and the channel a lot. Consider subscribing if you enjoy the content, as I've got more fun videos planned. This has been Ironclad Lion, leading you through the ultimate campaign walkthrough of Star Sector. Thanks so much for watching and all the support on the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.